Section 2, Removal. This section is a general overview of steps that most builders will be able to use to disconnect and remove their engine from the chassis. Get your vehicle placed, jacked, and secured. Now let's take a look under the hood. All right, now we're ready to start clearing things out of the way to get ready for pulling the motor. Everybody should begin in the same place for every make, model, and engine type ever made. Start at the battery. If you look in a repair manual, they always say the same thing as the first step of any major engine work. Disconnect the negative terminal of the battery. When you use a tool to loosen the negative terminal, you won't get a spark if the tool accidentally touches the metal of the car. The negative terminal is already grounded and is considered the safe side of the battery. That's why it comes off first. Around the positive terminal, you have to be more careful. If your wrench or any other metal tool touches the positive terminal of the battery and a metal part of the car at the same time while the negative is still connected, you're going to get a big nasty crackling spark. Electrical sparks can be dangerous, so wear glasses and gloves and disconnect the negative terminal first so you don't risk starting a fire or permanently damaging the electrical system of your car. The next thing, if you're going to pull out the radiator, is to get as much of the water out of the system as you can. Somewhere on the bottom of your radiator, there will be a petcock valve. Once you place some type of catch container under the drain valve, you can fully open it and let it run to drain the water. If you open the radiator cap, it'll drain faster, but don't open up either of these until a hot engine has had a chance to cool down. Now turn your attention to the top side of the motor. Your engine will probably look just as complicated, if not more so, than this one here. Your repair manual is going to have a bunch of wiring and vacuum diagrams that you can refer to now and later, but a lot of people have a hard time relating a perfectly drawn schematic to the real world mess that you're going to find under the hood. Do yourself the favor. Start taking great notes right now. You should go around every single wire, cable, hose, or linkage and put a piece of tape on it as a label. After you put a label on one end of a hose or wire, write a number on the label. Then, next to that number, write down the name of the hose or vacuum line or whatever it is. Also make sure to label both sides of everything that won't be left in the engine bay. You can also make a note or put a description about how and what it was connected to. This is where the specific shopper repair manual for your particular year, make, and model will help you the most. Look up the year and size of your engine and a good manual should have plenty of details throughout that explain what all the different external pieces and accessories are for your particular engine. As you pull pieces off the engine, you need to be thorough. This is the groundwork for a smooth installation down the line. One flawless way to make up for a less than perfect memory is to take a bunch of pictures to go along with your notes. Even better than that would be to videotape short clips of everything up close while you take them apart. As you come across hoses like fuel and water lines, you might want to put a rag under those. When you pull them off, they're usually going to leak quite a bit. Now that some time has passed, let's check on the draining of the radiator. If the dripping has slowed down, we can assume that most of the water is gone from the upper radiator hose and we can pull it off, but be aware that there might be some coolant left inside the water neck of the intake manifold. When all the coolant is out, don't pour it into the gutter or on the ground. In most cities, it's okay to flush coolant down the toilet so that it can be treated at the sewage plant. Now that all the topside lines and hoses are clear, let's take a look at any linkages or topside accessories. Now it'll be time to remove some nuts and bolts. As you move around the motor, whenever possible, put the nut or bolt right back where it came from. If it has to stay apart, make sure that you start to put loose nuts, bolts, and brackets in bins or bags that are labeled according to where they came from. Continue labeling and removing, and remember to take notes or pictures when you get to more complex areas like the throttle linkage. It's pretty much a guarantee that your car is going to be completely different in many subtle ways from the engines that we took apart in this video. So as mentioned before, your best bet is to be very thorough when you record what everything looked like before you took it apart. If we examine the internal designs of all the various types of engines, we'll find many more similarities than differences. It's out here, on the exterior of the motor, where we see the major differences between the many brands of cars and their various systems for ignition and electrical and their fuel delivery and emissions controls. 
But unfortunately, it's just not possible to find a manual that will cover every name and connection of every hose and wire for every model of car that's listed in the manual. So once again, it all comes back to you and how well you've taken notes. Like we said before, don't rely only on your memory. Sometimes these projects get delayed and six months from now, you're gonna forget if the red wire went to the right side or the left side of that thingy that was next to the whatchamacallit. Make a note or take a picture and you're not gonna have to memorize where everything went. Believe us, this will make all the difference when it's time to put everything back together later on. All right, with that said, let's get back to pulling this thing apart. In a lot of cases, the radiator needs to be pulled to make room for the block to come out. Start with the lower hose. Here's a little warning. Yes, you've drained the radiator, but there's still going to be some coolant in the bottom of it. And when you pull this hose, you should have something under it to catch the water. If you have an automatic transmission, chances are there's going to be transmission cooling lines going into the radiator. There's no easy way to drain the transmission cooling fluid from most radiators. So you just crack open the lines with a flare nut wrench and you let them bleed. When you do this, put something under there to catch the fluid. Make sure it's an oil collecting container and not the one that you just use for the coolant in the lower radiator hose. If you want, you can put some rubber or vinyl plugs on the ends of the lines to help stop the drips. Once again, every car is different. On one of ours, we weren't able to remove the fan shroud before the fan was out, so we just laid it aside. But on the other car, it just needed to be turned upside down and it slid right out. If you're planning on leaving the transmission in the chassis and pulling the engine out by itself, you should be able to leave most of the accessories attached to the front of the block. If you're concerned about room, or you're going to leave the transmission attached to the block, you'll want to remove as many of the front accessories as you can. If this is the case, start with the fan. To pull it out, you'll have to loosen all the accessories with belts on them, and then place the fan shroud out of the way. Then you can pull the fan belts and tape them together in the same order that they came off the car, so you can remember how to put them back later, if they're reusable. Mark an arrow on the tape to show the front of the engine. Now you can pull off the fan and water pump pulley. In a lot of cases, this will help provide the extra clearance necessary to pull the motor out. On one of our other cars, we pulled off the radiator, and then these fan shroud bolts were able to screw right back into the bracket that holds the radiator on. Most radiator brackets are usually only a few bolts, and then they come right off. But once again, swap out your catch container to the water collector, because when you pull the radiator out, it's still going to have some water floating around in the bottom of it. So by now, the top side of the motor should be pretty clear. Double check the sides as well. If you have a power steering pump, sometimes you can remove it from its bracket and just swing it right out of the way. Then you can use a piece of wire or something to just kind of tie it up there and hold it in place. If you're going to be leaving the transmission in the chassis like we are, one last thing to get the top end ready is to pull the upper transmission uh, bell housing bolts. All transmissions have some type of bell housing that bolts to the engine block. On many manual transmissions, the bell house is a separate piece of the transmission that houses the flywheel and the clutch plate and disc. Some types of manual transmissions can be separated from the bell housing while it's still connected to the block. Most automatic transmissions have the bell housing permanently molded as a fixed part of the transmission. In either case, the bell housing will be connected to the block with a number of bolts. On most engines, there will be two, or maybe more, upper bolts that are much easier to get to from the top. A stubby wrench is often the best tool when space is limited. If you're unable to get enough leverage from one side, give it a shot from another angle. Once you have the upper bolts out, we need to be able to get under the car. When you're using a jack, there's one overriding rule. You should never get under a car that is only supported by a jack. Our standard procedure is to set the chassis of the car so that the engine hoist is going to be able to roll far enough under the car so that the pickup chain will have access to the center area of the block and the wheels of the hoist will be safely rolling on a smooth, hard surface. Once there are at least two jack stands in place, give the car a good shake. If it's wobbly, don't get under it until it's absolutely safe and solid. Also, never use cinder blocks to hold a car up. They're not strong enough to trust your life with. Once you're totally confident that thousands of pounds of metal are supported properly above you, let's get under it and get back to work. If you have some type of bell housing or torque converter cover, you'll need to pull it off first so you can get to the starter. 
Do a quick double check right now and make sure that your battery is disconnected. Then start to back out the starter bolts alternately until one of them comes out. Then thread that same bolt back in by hand a few turns. Now you can remove the other bolt completely, then push the starter up all the way and remove the remaining bolt by hand. Be aware, starters are very heavy and the wires that connect to them are usually not very long on top of the fact that you're under the car with limited leverage. So you might want to have some type of box and some blocks of wood to support this heavy little guy as it comes loose. Since the battery negative is disconnected, it's safe to pull the big wire off the starter. It's the one that would be coming directly from the positive side of the battery. Or on some engines, this big wire comes from a remote starter solenoid. Then the little wires can come off. Some starters have two little wires, some have just one. Pay close attention to which wires went to each place on the starter. As soon as you have the starter secured, you'll need to label the wires and record their numbers and any other notes that you might think are necessary for when you put it all back together. With automatic transmissions, the disc that connects the crankshaft and transmission is called the flex plate. On a manual transmission, the disc is called a flywheel and it has other pieces of the clutch assembly connected to it. An automatic transmission has a torque converter instead of the clutch assembly. To separate the engine block from the transmission, you need to remove the bell housing bolts that attach it to the block and undo the motor mounts. Then the engine with the flex plate or flywheel attached would be clear to pull directly away from the transmission and then up and out. For manual transmissions, you just need to be aware that the transmission shaft needs to clear first before hoisting up. One big difference between automatic and manual transmissions is that the torque converter of an automatic is physically bolted to the flex plate and it's a lot easier to deal with if you just leave it in place on the transmission side. There's usually three, but sometimes four, bolts that make this connection. You're going to need to rotate the flex plate by hand so that you can remove these bolts one by one. There are special tools available for rotating some brands of flex plates. If you don't have one of these tools, you can clamp a pair of vice grips on the flex plate and spin it a little bit at a time. If you want to, removing the spark plugs for this will make the rotating a lot easier. When the bolts are out, you'll be able to push the converter to the rear and it should spin freely. This will mean that internally, the engine is now disconnected from the automatic transmission. Now let's do the exhaust. These bolts might cause you a lot of problems. They're usually corroded and a lot of times they're completely frozen stuck. One way to minimize the risk of stripping a bolt or a nut is to make sure that you use 6-point tools instead of 12-point. If some stubborn bolt breaks off, you're actually better off than if a nut had stripped and you weren't able to get it off. In that case, you might need to cut the bolt or stud with a hacksaw or a welder's torch to get everything apart. Almost every time it's an ordeal to get an exhaust flange to come off. Just take your time and don't damage other parts of the car while you're prying and smacking on stuff. On this engine, when we turned to the passenger side, we had to use 18 inches worth of extensions to make it easier to get up to where the bolts of the exhaust manifolds were. And one bolt had broke off, but at least we were able to clear the exhaust pipes without too much trouble. At this point, you should look around the engine bay. All of the lines, cables, or hoses that connect the engine to the chassis should be clear now. For our rebuild, we're going to leave the transmission in place. This means that we need to unbolt the rest of the bell housing from the block. On this engine, there are still bolts in the middle and bottom areas. Let's refer to them as the two mid and the two lower transmission bolts. The upper bolts were the ones that we took out before. Some engines have two pins on either side of the bell housing. They're alignment dowels and we won't need to deal with them for the removal. As we loosened this first mid bolt, we ran into a little problem. We couldn't get it out. It was too close to the firewall to fully unthread. We had to thread it back in, but we left it a little loose so that we could allow the hoist to lift the motor, and then we'll deal with that later. You'll see what we mean in a minute. On to the lower bolt on the same side. Just loosen any bolts in the lower area, but don't unthread them or take them all the way out. Over on the passenger side, we had to use a big long double extension to get up in between the transmission and the exhaust pipe. A flex socket on the end of an extension is the easiest way to get at the bell housing bolts from under the car. Sometimes you can't even use a stubby wrench in these close quarters 
So an extension and a U-joint are really helpful to kind of turn the corners and get at bolts that you can't really see. When you get to your two lowermost bolts, you're just gonna have them loose and not unthreaded. They should be the only two left out of all the bell housing bolts. Now you can remove any bolts that hold the two halves of the motor mounts together or if you have any fasteners that hold your motor mounts to the chassis of the car. When the motor mount bolts are out, the engine is basically just sitting there ready to be picked up. It's connected to the frame at the two motor mount points and the back end is supported by the transmission mount that's sitting on the frame cross member. Next, you need to install the lifting chain or plate. In either case, you have to use grade 8 bolts. If you're using a chain, we suggest you use one that is rated to hold at least 1,500 pounds. Connect it diagonally from one bolt hole in the back of the head to the same bolt hole in the front of the head. If you're using the lift plate, make sure all of the bolts thread in at least a half inch each. Further in would be preferred. For this engine, we used a chain, and once it was on and the bolts were tight, we pulled up on it to make sure that it wasn't interfering with anything. Distributors are usually in the way, but it's okay to loosen them up to clear the lifting chain interference. Double check the ground below the car, make sure that it's clear of any tools or rocks, and roll your engine hoist in and hook it up to your chain or plate. As you raise it up, every few cranks, you should check to make sure that everything's okay. First, the upper halves of the motor mounts will clear the lower halves and keep checking for problems. Then, the bell house of the transmission will contact the firewall. If the distributor is in the way, you could remove the cap or just pull the whole distributor out. Give the hoist a push towards the transmission to make sure that the bell house mates with the rear of the block. Our problem bolt is now touching the firewall, but we'll deal with that in a second. Now we need to shim the transmission with a stack of blocks or a jack and a block of wood. Or better yet, if you have a transmission jack, roll it under there. Don't raise it up any, just give it a little place to sit and make sure that it's supported well so that the tranny can't drop down. Once the transmission's supported, you can remove those last two lower bolts from the bell housing. Now crank the engine up just a little until it seems like it might be about to float freely. The only thing holding this engine to the car right now is that one problem bolt that we had before. All we had to do though was jack up the hoist a little bit, get an open end wrench in there, and when it was loose again, the engine was floating freely. The bolt was fully unscrewed and it stayed in the bell housing hole, but the motor was free to pull away from the transmission. Once your motor is floating, just go a little bit at a time. There's always little things in the way like transmission vacuum lines or starter wires. But if you take your time and crank up a little, then pull back, then crank up some more, everything should go smoothly. Keep checking in between every few cranks, and soon you'll be all clear to crank all the way up as high as you need to go to roll the motor out. Make sure that no one is under the car once the motor is off its mounts, and definitely don't stand under or around the engine as you roll it away from the chassis. Once the engine was clear and lowered safely, we had a chance to remove the problem bolt and put it in a storage bin with the rest of the fasteners from the removal process. With the engine lowered safely, you should either stabilize it on some blocks or get it onto a set of dolly wheels. Now this engine is ready to be rolled into the shop area to be taken apart.